everyone. This is Stephen Weintraub from Collider.com, and I am, for years, I've been trying to put on a panel about directors talking about directing, and it's been an incredible challenge, but I'm so happy for this year's Comic-Con at home that uh, it's finally able to happen with these three gifted filmmakers. Gentlemen, um, thank you so much for doing this panel. Uh, how's everyone doing? Very good. Excellent. What do you think would surprise movie fans about the process of movie making that they might not know? How long it takes. Mm -hmm. I think, I think a lot of people think filmmaking is from you know day one of shooting to uh, to uh, either last day of shooting or maybe even the editorial process. But I don't think people understand all the upfront time to getting to that first day of photography. And for director, um, that's a part of the job that people don't really talk about. Uh, you know, the year and a half, two years, three years of constant nurturing you're doing to a project to even get it to that, that first day. And um, so, so for all of us, a film is, it is like raising a child. I mean, it could be uh, years before before you get get on the set, so I think that's something that people don't quite understand. It's kind of hard to fathom sometimes how many things have to go right in order for a movie to work uh, at every single level, at every single turn, from you know the writing process to you know the visual development to when you're actually shooting to editorial. There's so many different people uh, who have to be doing their best work all the time in order for something to actually come together and work, and it's. It's not a matter of experience because there's people who are hugely experienced who've made movies that didn't work and people who've had no experience at all who've made outstanding movies. And so there's just this alchemy that, that no one really knows how to, how to create it. But if, if everybody's working uh, together in the right way, uh, that, that magic can happen. It's a, it's a huge um, brain commitment. A lot of your mental real estate goes into the shooting process. You know, you could be writing, you could be prepping. You could be getting ready, but when you start shooting, that's when you're spending the most amount of money per day. And you have to be on, you have to be on and you don't turn it off. And actually as I'm driving home, usually after I've done a day's shoot, I feel the body start to, to go down because it realizes you're done for today because you've just been at this level of efficiency that you're not at, at that point at any other time in your life. You're never at that level where you have to be on for everybody and be saying, this is the next shot, this is the next five shots. It's, your brain is constantly going, it's a, it's a rat race, no matter, and I think people would think, even when you have a big budget, that you don't have that. No, you have to move still very fast and have the answers and have the vision and the direction. And it's a, it's a big break for him. It's hard to sleep at night, it's hard to, usually if the crew gets sick, the director doesn't get sick. Not till they wrap and then suddenly they're carrying that sickness the whole time drop <laughs> right after that for weeks because you know you can't you can't stop so it's really uh um, and then when you go into post I, I wish i could stay that efficient through post then you're back on your own schedule and the shoot itself is very intense it's very intense and uh it takes a lot of stamina and it takes a lot of you. it surprises me every time and i've shot you you all have to go in and essentially pitch the studio on a vision or ultimately there's someone who you need to say you know, has says yes to what you want to do. What is it like to go in and pitch on these big movies or pitch the Hollywood studio system? I, I feel like that's probably changed a lot since your career started, Robert, because I feel like now there's there's this other element of this is why we have to go to the movie theater to see the movie. Right. Uh, and that you didn't used to have to make that case quite as much. Um, and so now it, that that's a part of it. And And yet in the end, I feel like there's a, you have to make an emotional case for your film. You have to to really be able to lay out, you know, what people are going to feel uh, when the, while they're watching this movie and when they come out of this movie and why it's then why it's going to be worth going to the theater to have that emotional experience. But if you're not dialed into that, if if I think there's probably just an assumption that we go in and show a bunch of pictures and 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 some kind of reel uh, and that's enough and tell them you know, tell them what the set pieces are going to be. But I found, and maybe some places that's true, but I've, I've been fortunate enough that, that in the films that I've made, uh, people, are, people really wanna know why we're making this movie. That was the first conversation I ever had with, with my boss now, why is Jurassic Park 4? 
I agree. It's all about the story. Yeah, maybe 10 years ago, there was a moment where it was about kind of the rip reel or the concept art or the visual presentation. But uh, I think Colin's uh, exactly right in that now uh, you really need to make a compelling argument as to why this story deserves to be told on the big screen. So it's a slightly different angle, but it's a good one because it's really, it's, um, it's, it's more story based. It's more uh, it's, it's a bit more thoughtful, uh, approach. Yeah. I know for Alita, that was the first time I had to do something in that scale and scope. Usually I, I had a handful of drawings I made myself or, or something that I edited myself or animated and would take that and tell them basically what it is. And then we'd be off and going, but this was going to be a huge financial commitment. So, um, I went in, Jim and I said, we're going to synchronize our watches and take the hill. I was like, wow, I had tons of art that he had done back in 2005 for Alina that I put up around the room. And I had to actually write myself a whole script that I could go through that was a synopsis of the movie so they could hear the whole thing and feel the heart of the film and feel the reason why to do it. So it was a good 45 minute talk. I had a, like, it's like I wrote a whole other document to, to read while I showed the arts. They could see what it was. And that was to get a green light to develop that further, to then get a budget, to then do a reel of art and to do all new um, material for them to see of what the world would look like, then go repitch it. So that was pretty amazing to get to do that because by the time they greenlit us, we could, we started shooting like four months later because we had already basically prepped the movie. So that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I never had to do that before but I could see how it's very helpful to just over-prepare like that, walk them through the movie, make them feel what the movie is, know what the story is, really know that this character is gonna be the thing people latch on to and uh, before they commit the money because they just, it's a huge commitment now between marketing and releasing. Um, it's, it's just, it's incredible how much they have to spend and they have to spend wisely. It's not like the old days at all. Uh, have you guys, do you typically get super nervous before a meeting like that? Like the night before, are you spinning in your head the way you're spinning when you're on a movie set? Because this is ultimately the people that will say yes or no to your vision. I think at the beginning, certainly, yeah, that, was, that first, uh, I'm sure we all remember our first kind of pitch where it felt like this is it, you know, this is my make or break moment. Um, but uh, over time, I realized that um, it's more important just to kind of be comfortable with your story and speak from the heart and um, don't get too wound up about it. Just uh, go in and tell a story. And if it's something you're passionate about, I think that will naturally come across and kind of be the most effective thing. The confidence with which you tell your story in that room uh, will create confidence in itself that you both understand it and that you're gonna be able to communicate it to others because uh, that's so much of what the job is. Every, I mean, I have, I have so many conversations with people who are not you know, traditionally known as creative, uh, you know, in creative positions that are purely technical positions, but we talk story all the time because the more people know about the story, uh, not just you know, the better the movie will be, but also uh, the more true the movie's gonna be to, to what you're trying to accomplish. So we, I try to communicate it not just to the studio, but to, uh, to everybody. I really love pitching when you don't have to do the full, when you do the full presentation with the art, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Like that one, Alita, they, they owned Alita. So I, there wasn't, you can't just go across the street and sell it to somebody else because your pitch actually gets better when you go, the more you tell it. So usually probably the place you sell it is like the third place because by then you've got it down. So the more you can practice your pitch, the better. But have you ever seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? You gotta, uh, this is how you gotta pitch like Ricky Roma. You have to pitch, to where they don't realize they're being pitched. You have to walk in and be pitching something completely different and ask what they're at, one on their slate. And when they say like a family film, you go, oh, you know what, I kind of I kind of have a family film. You know what I like about this? And then you start pitching it and before you know it, they won't let you out of the room. That's like the best way to get them. It's so fun. It's fun to come up with something, try it. If you can sell it, great. If not, you go come up with something else, you know. But the ones that are the big budget ones where you have to do the whole, that's nerve wracking because you've put all this time and effort into it. And if it doesn't go, you got to start all over. But if you can get, get the pitches down to something that you could have come up with over a week before, that's, that's really gratifying. That's, that's, that's really fun.
what is it like sitting down with the person you want to cast for that initial meeting, hoping that this thing is going to work out? I'm sure each of you has a, a fun story. The one that comes to mind for me is my first one, which was uh, Jeff Bridges for Tron Legacy. We, um, that was a very interesting process because before we had a script, I had kind of an idea of what, what the story would be and an idea for kind of a, a trailer uh, for the movie. Um, so I got a meeting with Jeff Bridges and had to pitch him to be in a trailer for a movie that had not been written yet. Um, and getting him to agree to that was, uh, was huge because, you know, you can't make that movie without Jeff and him having the faith in a kid who had never made a movie before and only really had made a couple commercials to, to be a, a part of that teaser, um, was, it was a big leap of faith on his part. So, and, and ultimately is what got that movie going. Sure, both of you had that experience of like early on when no one has any idea uh, who you are or what you're like, and and that's what you're like is the most important part because people do talk to each other. Like if you're if you if you're good on set and you you care about other people and you support actors and and you listen to actors, actors talk to each other, uh, and over time that kind of a reputation builds up. But when you're just starting out, you're just this kid, and so in the end they're kind of just like looking deep into your soul. And to see, and just you know, quietly deciding whether you're the kind of person that they're going to trust, and uh, and that you know that that works for for people you're trying to to convince on every level. So, uh, my my experience, whether it was, was was a little bit more recently, you know, with with the actors in in uh, in Dominion, with you know, it's these legends, it's Laura Dern and Sam Neill and Jeff Goldblum, who the la the last time they played these roles. They were directed by Steven Spielberg. And then here am I, and you know, they know that I exist, but you know, they, they, they want to know, they want to know my heart. And so I, I think making sure that they're going to trust you the way that they trusted uh, somebody like that. Uh, it's, it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking. It's getting Bruce Willis in Sin City. We, he was our first and only choice to play hard again, but you know, you have to convince him to be in it. What, what helped tremendously. And this is when I really first saw the value of having not just art, but a reel or something to show was because I, to convince Frank Miller to even have to do Sin City, I went and shot a whole opening scene to Sin City in my green screen and put in the effects that I wanted with my small team. And I had, it was just to convince Frank and from Frank signed on, well, now we had this cool little short film we could show people. So I took it to Bruce and Bruce watched it and showed the opening scene of the movie, Josh Arnett, Marley Shelton, and then fake titles with the music I put on it. And the fake titles had him starring in it. So I said, look, you have to be in the movie. Your, your name's in the credits. And he looked at me and went, I'm in. Because <laughs> he could see the, the graphic novel looked amazing, but he could see how it translated to screen and he could see himself being in it. So that was, that was a real eye opener to me. It would have been a much harder conversation if I didn't have all that, if I just had the book even. I'd be like, okay, well, how that, how's that going to look? It was so new and so different. This was 2003. You know, this was way back when people didn't even know what green screen was. So um, to see it was, was to believe it. And that really helped. When you're making a project in these worlds with these diehard fans, can you sort of talk about towing the line between pleasing the fans, but also making your own vision for what you want to do? Could be a whole other, could do a whole other hour on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think there's something really interesting that is ha that we have discovered generationally, you know, for, for people who are you know, roughly our age and that uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these films that were made, you know, in the seventies and the eighties uh, in a lot of ways have, have become our, they're almost a belief system for some of us. Like there are, there are myths in a way that is, that is so powerful uh, and it goes beyond, you know, just being a film and so when you start to uh, when you start to to delve into telling further stories, uh, you know, another chapter in the Bible and another testament uh, that it gets very complicated because uh, we hold our beliefs uh, very, very close and we hold them uh, in a very, very personal way. Uh, and I think the only way to even begin to approach it is to to respect that, to like to respect that it is possible for something created. 30, 40 years ago uh, to, to be as personal for someone uh, as, as a belief system or a religion is for other people. 
Uh, and I respect that. I'm kind of one of those people in a lot of ways. Uh, and if, if you can approach it that way, uh, then, you know, you just have to, to trust yourself that, that your instincts uh, are just as strong as anyone else who grew up on that thing uh, and, and follow them, I guess. But it's, uh, it, is, it is a dangerous game. You're never going to please everybody. You know, I would just kind of go, I'll just go make my own thing. You know, follow the George Lucas model. He wanted to do Flash Gordon, couldn't get the right. So he wrote Star Wars instead. So for a long time, I would just do that. Then every once in a while, a project shows up that you really want to do. And you brave it because you go, look, I, I just got to make it really resonate with me. But something like Sin City, I thought, you know, that that just coincided with the fact that I wanted to make it that way, where it was the whole point was to make it not stray from the graphic novel because it was brilliant as is. And I shot it frame for frame, which is why I brought Frank Miller on as a co-director. That was as faithful as you could get, but that was the exercise. Other ones where you would stray from it quite a bit, that, that would be... You know, that's tough. That's now, now you're, you're balancing a lot of plates. And I always admire those who can pull those kind of shows off because you are trying to satisfy a rabid fan base while making something that works for you. Yet it's not just for you. Where my movies tend to be very personal. It's like, if it's really true to me, then it's authentic to at least someone. And they'll know that it wasn't just factory made, that it was that somebody is behind this in a big way. And, and they can kind of recognize that. But on a huge movie, you, it's got to go beyond that. You got to tell uh, tell your story. Um, the idea of fan service is a very uh, alluring, tricky thing because it is a um, it's kind of like an easy win. Um, but uh, ultimately, you have to decide does does this serve the story you're telling, and let your story be your guide. And uh, if you use that as your your bar, then um, I think generally you'll make the right choice. Uh, Joe, you have uh, Top Gun at Paramount, Top Gun 2. Uh, Colin, you have the new Jurassic World at Universal. Robert, you have uh, We Can Be Heroes, which is Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, three, uh, these are the next uh, projects for all three of you. I know everyone watching right now is definitely curious about all three. Uh, what can you, for each of you, what can you tease about these movies? We're in the home stretch. Uh, we were supposed to be out June 26th, um, but everything got pushed down. Um, luckily, we were we were deep in post, so it's something we were able to finish. Uh, doing it remotely has been very interesting, but possible. We we made a uh, an old school movie um, using kind of the latest technology, so um, it's definitely a, a Top Gun movie, and um, I'm can't wait to show it to people. Actually, just hours ago, before we uh, taped this, it was it was uh, announced that we're going to be going back into production uh, in a couple of weeks um, on Jurassic World Dominion. So we we had to stop, just like the rest of the world. Uh, and now uh, there's just a real sense of of family and camaraderie amongst everyone who knows that uh, we're going to really need to support each other uh, to to do what we're about to do. Uh, if you can imagine. Uh, the challenge of making a movie like this in the first place. Um, and I'm sure as you, you've seen, if you saw the last movie, you know, this is not just, you know, some people on an Island anymore. It's, it's a really, you know, large scale global epic story uh, with characters from uh, the original Jurassic Park, all in major roles. Uh, and of course, you know, Bryce and, and Chris. And so all of these people uh, have come together uh, in a really inspiring way. Uh, and we have zooms together and we, you know, we have, you know, chat threads together as, as we try to get uh, each other, you know, inspired and kind of riled up uh, for, for what we need to uh, attempt to do. And the biggest challenge uh, for me is that, you know, we, we have tons of protocols and, and many, many layers uh, of, of, of safety and protection for everybody, because that's obviously the top priority. But uh, once all of that uh, has uh, been applied, it's still going to be a couple people uh, in the center of a circle trying to make something feel real and honest. And so to, to find that in the context of all this, we may be the first ones out uh, doing that. And so we'll, we'll certainly report back, but uh, we definitely have the right team. I think a lot of filmmakers wish they had a break in the middle of a shoot to allow them to look at what they had and to think about what they want to do in the future. You, you were shooting for almost a month. How has this hiatus 
maybe impacted your script or your action set pieces? Has it allowed you to look at what you had and what you wanted to do in a different way? Uh, man, I, I wish we all had that. Uh, that's, I'm sure everyone agrees, the ability to to just stop and, and think for a second about what you were doing, uh, cut it together, uh, make sure that, especially if you're trying something you know really new, uh, that what you believed would work is working. Uh, and we, we did, we got to do that. And uh, we didn't really change the script much, but we, we definitely were able to, to cut and go into, uh, put several sequences through the visual effects pipeline and, and really, in a lot of ways, establish relationships uh, between each other. Some people have worked together a lot before. Like with any movie, you're forging creative relationships over the process of it. And so to be able to have this time uh, for all of us to know how we work together, to know each other, uh, and then to, to head back in uh, to, you know, to what, what will be a, a challenge. At least we're doing it with people we know really, really well. My most rabid fan base by far over all these years has been my, like my kid films, my Spy Kids audience. <laughs> these kids watch those movies over and over because they're, they're action films made for, for children and families, in particular at a time when they need empowerment. Netflix had come to me because the Spy Kid movies had just done so well in their service. As could you make us a, a, a series of films that that do that? And I said I'd love to. I, you know, it was hard to make them for the theater because kids couldn't just drive themselves to the theater and watch it a thousand times. They'd have the parents have to, would have to take them. But on Netflix, they could just sit there. You know, I don't I don't have to sit there and watch Glitter Force with my daughter. She can go click it as many times as she wants. That's why those they get such high numbers on those types of films. So I said, yeah, I would love to, because my kids are now at the age where they can make the films alongside me. And so we came up with this uh, team of, almost like an Avengers superhero team, but they all have kids and the kids uh, have powers, but they don't know how to use them because they're just so young. And it's uh, it's really fun. I never, it was the most challenging movie I had done because as any director would know, the most challenging scene to do is like a dinner scene where you got 11 people. Well, the whole movie, I had 11 superhero kids in every shot trying to figure out how to film that <laughs> was, was incredible. It's really challenging yet exciting. And, and I already shot it and was editing it when this happened and I'm scoring right now. That's why I had a limited time today. We're scoring in Vienna and I'm remotely listening over here in the other room. <laughs> and uh, I can't be in the orchestra room like, like usual, but they're all sitting like six feet apart in Vienna. It's, it's a wild time. But yeah, huge cast. Pedro Pascal plays sort of like the Antonio Banderas type role. Uh, Boyd Holberg, we had a huge cast. Um, even Shark Boy and Lava Girl even show up as um, superhero parents who now have a daughter who's got shark and lava powers. And she's like six. And they're all doing amazing martial arts. What's crazy is they came in so trained already. A lot of them had already had training um, to do amazing stunts and action and and uh, martial arts that you wouldn't expect from nine, 10 year olds. It's pretty, pretty, pretty fun movie. So I can't wait for that to come out. It's coming out soon on Netflix. I'm curious about technology. Uh, you guys obviously are at the forefront of the industry in terms of hearing about what's going on and what CGI can do. Um, what, what has happened in the last year or two that has really excited you with technology? And what do you think is about to happen in the future that might be able to impact what we get out of movies or what we can do in movies, if anything. In my world, I mean, there are things that I've observed that uh, it's cool to watch people do them, but I'm not necessarily looking to do it myself. Uh, we've actually gone more practical with every uh, Jurassic movie we've made since the first one, and we have more animatronics in this one uh, than we have in the previous two. Um, and and the thing that that I found, just especially in you know in working uh, in, in the past couple of months, is that we finally reached a point where it's possible to the, the ele digital extensions on animatronics will be able to match the, the texture uh, and, and the, the level of, of fidelity uh, that uh, on film uh, an animatronic is going to be able to, to bring. And you, you didn't used to be able to really mix them. Like you could really see the, you could really see the seams. Uh, and so that part of it is, is very exciting for me. And, and also just in the context of our stuff, we've, Jay Bayona really, uh, he, he found the value in, in creating uh, really photo real, just beautiful lighting references that, that could be articulated just slightly, just a, just a head and a jaw that could move. 
and the ability to, but, but painted beautifully, hand painted. And we do it for all of the dinosaurs now. So we put it into a space. You can see how the light, you know, reacts to the skin. Like, and uh, when, even if they ultimately do make that, you know, a digital animal, there was always something there, you know, reacting to the light in that environment uh, that uh, has proven to be uh, just puppetry in general, really simple puppetry has proven to be uh, amazing. Yeah, along those lines, for me, the, the technology that allows filmmaking to be uh, more practical is kind of the most, is the stuff I get most excited about. Um, on Top Gun, uh, we, we worked with Sony to develop a, uh, an IMAX quality camera that's about this big um, and only like two inches deep. So we were able to mount six of them inside the cockpit um, and four on the outside of the airplane. Um, so in that case, we're using technology to capture something real rather than having to create it on a soundstage. Um, so that was, for me was kind of, was one of the things that, that I was excited about in you know jumping into the project in the first place. What's the resolution on something like that and how does it compare to a film camera? It's a, uh, it's a 6K camera, so, um, 6,000 pixels wide. It's a large format sensor, uh, which is bigger than a 35 millimeter sensor. Um, it's like a cinemascope, I think is the, is the, you know, the comparable film size. Uh, the, the real technology breakthrough is that the sensor can be separated from the recorder. So when you're looking at a digital camera, the, the only thing capturing the image is that first inch of the camera everything kind of behind that is power and recording and cooling and so uh this sony camera which is called the sony venice um you can buy a version where those two pieces are connected via uh some uh, fiber optic cable so the sensor with a very small lens can sit in a place you know a very tight place uh or right in front of the actor we had four of them pointing at the actor um on Top Gun and the recorders could be hidden in storage spaces on the jet. Uh, so you're just able to put, you know, something that normally, you know, normally you'd only be able to fit a GoPro there. Now you're able to put a IMAX quality camera in that spot. Uh, and in this case, six of them. So we have multi-camera coverage um, of these sequences uh, that you can cut a whole scene by just working with those six angles. So um, that to me was kind of our, our technology breakthrough on, on this movie. And it's just a really fun way to work when you're getting it all in camera. I worked with uh, Claudio Miranda, who you work with, Joe. And um, he'd shown me pictures uh, of this, the environment you had around the Oblivion set, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, was amazing. That could be an amazing way to just get, you know, I could, I could be anywhere right now and you wouldn't know. I would just be in front of a screen that was lighting me uh, without using lights. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Wow. You think you've seen as far as technology can go and then something <laughs> shows up that just takes your breath away and you can't wait to go, to go try it. You know? It's got to be one of the biggest leaps forward is just the, the real time, you know, cinema quality render uh, right now that we've had in a bit. Um, I don't know how it's going to translate to the to the big screen. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. I, I, mean, I think Mandalorian you know, looks fantastic, and uh, and yet I, I think the you know, what 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 I got to to work on it at ILM, which I, I thought was amazing as well, was uh, having a, having a you know not a cinema quality render, but a render in VR that allowed us to use VR to travel around a, a world that we built. Uh, in order to essentially make a previs, uh, and we use it on, on Battle of Big Rock on the short that I did, uh, I shot that whole thing handheld in VR, uh, which which allowed me to to really be in the space, uh, you know, with actors and and have a sense of you know the immediacy that just being able to to capture it myself. I was just holding the camera, uh, and it, that was extremely exciting as a, just as a filmmaker to be able to to be in a you know in a fantasy space. Uh, but holding the camera yourself, I know it's, you know, it's this is what Cameron's doing. I know that you guys have done it as well, but as that continues uh, to advance, I, I can't imagine what the, the next generation is going to pull off. Uh, 
switching into something else, what's a detail or a decision that each of you had to fight for in one of your films that you're most proud of? Well, I wouldn't call it a fight, but um, the idea of hiring a uh, kind of a French electronic duo to do a major motion picture score at the time was <laughs> um, concerning and required a lot of conversations on Tron. Um, but uh, they quickly proved that they um, were up to the task and, um, and, and did a great job. So, uh, so and what do you say to convince them? Because it's like, did they say, we need orchestral type score? And you say, well, they can do that too. Or how did you convince them? Yeah, so well, it those- started, it just started with a conversation between me and, and Daft Punk about what we want to do. And we, we very quickly learned that we both wanted a hybrid score of electronics and orchestra. And, you know, I had been listening to their music for 10 or 15 years at that point and knew that their musicality it went much deeper than, you know, kind of just your standard electronic music. Um, but yeah, we went to Disney and and we agreed to, they agreed to meet every big composer in, in LA. And essentially we were going to do it as a partnership between them and on Zimmer or them and Alexander Desplat. So they went and met everybody. And after they had done all their meetings around town, they said, you know what, we think we think we can do it on our own um, uh, with an orchestrator. Um, so uh, they did a couple of demos um, and uh, and Disney, uh, you know, said, all right, let's give it a shot. And um, and we, you know, we started very early. I mean, the music for that film was written while we were shooting. So I was able to play it on set while we were shooting the movie, which was a very cool thing that I haven't been able to do since. Um, but uh, it was it, it, it was it was always there and around us while we were making the movie, which was really cool. First of all, if anyone has not heard the Tron Legacy soundtrack, it's, it's one of my all time favorite soundtracks. It's brilliant. It's amazing. And all of you need to own it. But uh, I just want to start with that. But Joe, um, I believe and I could be wrong about this, but didn't Daft Punk give you a bunch of music and some of it did not end up in the movie? So is it true or false that you still have unreleased Daft Punk music that might have been in Tron Legacy? I will neither confirm nor deny that there may be some incredible music um, that wasn't, uh, we weren't able to fit in the movie. Um, But but yeah, someday it would be nice to, um, to figure out some way to, to share that. I, I can't believe with the success of that soundtrack that Disney, maybe someone at Disney doesn't realize you guys could put out an extended soundtrack featuring unreleased <laughs> songs. Just brainstorming here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Disney needs Disney needs some uh, other uh, revenue streams right now. They're, they, uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if we decide to do that at some point. I think it'd be great. Yes. I love that score. I can think of, I mean, one is I, you know, changing the name of the franchise took some convincing. Uh, it was called Jurassic Park. And, and it, if you can imagine at the time, they were, they were pretty married to that. Uh, so me going in and writing a very carefully worded email uh, to Steven asking if I could, you know, change the name of his franchise. Uh, it wasn't a fight, but it, uh, it would, you know, it took a weekend uh, to figure that one out. Um, and the other one I would say is probably in my first movie is, is, uh, you know, that we changed the ending of that movie so that the time machine worked and safety not guaranteed after we had, we were done with the film and we'd been accepted into Sundance and, you know, we'd had, we'd had, we got what we were after, you know, we'd been recognized for having made something that, that worked. And, uh, I just had this instinct. I remember walking the streets of New York city and it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like mine. And there was just something wrong. And I went in and asked everyone, you know, will you, will you go with me if, if I fundamentally change at the end of this movie and the time machine does work, uh, which had never been discussed up to that point. Uh, and this was like two weeks before Sundance. Uh, and I did it and I, it could be argued that it, it might've changed the trajectory of my career, that, that singular choice. And I think there are a lot of moments that we, you know, we look back on as, as directors and, and they may have just been an instinct at the time. And then you realize that, well, that was, 
that was the thing that, that made this all, you know, come together and, and, and work in the first place. And, uh, it's, it's kind of a scary idea that can all come down to one, one call, but it, but it's true. For me, it was a big victory and it was an important one for things to follow, to have the kids and spy kids be a Latin family. It was actually, the studio was like, why are you making them Latin though? Why didn't you just make them American? And I was like, well, they are American. It's based on my family. My, my uncle actually, his name is Gregorio Rodriguez. He was a FBI agent, special agent in the FBI that brought down two of the top, the only one to bring down two top 10 criminals. That's who the Antonio character is based on. And I wanted to make a movie about my family because I grew up in a family of 10 kids, but a Latin, big Latin family. But I thought, well, I should make them spies so it's more interesting for people. <laughs> so it's not just about my family, but I wanted him to still retain, it's named after my sister, Carmen, my brother, Junie, and, and my uncle, Felix. And, and it had just never been done before. When you're doing anything that's new, this just happens to be about diversity, but it, it could be any, when you're doing anything new, you're going to get a question. And you have to have a good answer because they're not being dicks or anything. They were just like, they just never seen it before. But is not going to make the audience smaller if they think people think only Latins will go see it? And it's just because it had never been done before. So no, I don't think so. I mean, they only speak Spanish. It's kind of like code when it's cool. And they're, they are American. They're just Latin because it's based on my family. So then it wasn't really convincing. I finally had to come up with a good argument. Finally, I said, okay, you don't have to be British to enjoy James Bond. By being so specific, it becomes more universal. So they went with it. And then, of course, there's like four of those, and now we're rebooting it. <laughs> but but it, it, it really, you kind of had to put your put the flag in and, and set it in and say, this is how it's going to be done to, to make any change. Because no, there was no roles being written for Latins at that time, back in 1999. Um, nor were they being cast. Nor and, and if the director, if I was in Latin, I would have given up the fight because I would have went, okay, I just want to get the movie made because it was based on my family. It's the only reason I kept the fight up. And, and again, it wasn't a fight. They just weren't, they weren't sure why I would try why I would attempt doing something that could possibly limit an audience because it had just never been done before to be proven wrong. And why prove it with this movie, you know? So that, and that could be with any, with anything, a piece of technology or an idea that's new that you would come up against that. And as a filmmaker, you kind of have to make a stand and go, well, look, this is, this is kind of how I have to be. And you have to say it in a way that, they, that makes sense to them. So you got to just kind of work on your argument and then present it to them. And then they saw that, that it was just very cool. And those, anyone. I got to commend you for that, man. I got to commend you for that. We, we watched Spy Kids recently and I had a very similar conversation uh, with my wife uh, after we watched it. I feel like, you know, your legacy as a filmmaker uh, to, to be able to make a choice like that and then have it work financially, which is how things get done. Like when you show right. that it's going to make money and people are going to come see the movie. Uh, you know, that was, that was a major, a major choice for you and for, for you to push for that and for it to work so well. I think it, it really did pave the way for, for studios to trust that the choices like that yeah, uh, were going to work uh, in the future. So well done, man. Yeah. I, but again, you don't know either because you're trying and you're, and you're betting with their money, but you feel like you got to do it and it, things will never change if this doesn't happen. And you see that any kid can watch that movie and they enjoy that movie. For those who are Latin in particular, it means so much to them. It changes their whole future about what, what is possible. You know, I've had friends say, my kid laughed when they saw your name at the end. They go, look, his name's Rodriguez. Like, he's even Latin. The guy who made the movie, and they thought, they said, you said, you just changed their whole future of what's possible. You know, that's like an amazing thing that the power of media and the power of imaging and the power of what we do, you can change people's minds, especially in a world where this just seems like it's just going to hell. You know, media and entertainment and characters that they can an audience can see and, and model themselves after or be inspired by are the last chance to offer any kind of hope and ideas and ideals and values. Morality, that was the reason I wanted to do We Can Be Heroes because I thought kids today are just seeing such, such anger and hatred out there and, and just bleakness. It's really up to the next generation. And that's why the little kids have to take over from their parents who have screwed up the whole world and step up sooner and they have to come in, and they have to come into their own. I'm going to give them characters that they can model themselves after. Eleven superheroes that, that are all ethnically diverse and all with ideas of empowerment and how the world is messed up and how it's really up to them and they have to start now. 
and we're looking to them. And that that was that's the meaning of the movie. And it, it, it was very um, on point two years ago, even more so now that it's about to come out. I mean, it just gets crazier out there. And and that's the last, that's the, the real hope of entertainment is that you can create a character that can do all the things that reality isn't doing for them and give them something they'll watch over and over just because it's fun and they'll come away with food for thought on how they can change the world in the future. That's why it's called We Can Be Heroes because it's like a very empowering thing for them. Uh, next door, my son actually uh, is, is wrote the score. I was supposed to write it what? with my son and he kicked my ass. He wrote circles around me. So now I just bring him coffee and feed him, but I was going to go, Oh, he's, he's taking care of it all. He, he, he took piano since he was five. And I really wanted this to feel more like it came from a kid. And I wrote spy kids music to be kind of like kid like music. So I thought, well, I should write with my son. Instead, he wrote something so sophisticated that I never would have thought of for, for a kid's film. It's more like, John Williams Superman <laughs> and it's awesome now I'm just like I didn't know I was gonna pull myself out of a job I loved composing and I'm, and I'm, I'm finished I'm done this guy just, just railroaded me so he's in there doing it so I'm not hearing bleed through so I can kind of I can stay on this call how old's oh. your son he's 20 Jesus wow. 20 full hundred piece orchestra you would not believe this music it's like I couldn't believe Amazing. I heard it As my like, son is currently making uh, tenet fan fiction based on only the trailer he has no idea what happens in the movie but he's so fired up <laughs> yeah. that he's making a he's making a film set in the world of tenet based on his interpretation of what happens in that world wow that's fun it's funny because you know the kids they're right now the age where i was when i was doing mariachi so you you see that laser-like focus that you were able to have when you had nothing else going on in your life you know you're not juggling kids and multiple jobs when you would just not not move and he cranked out that whole that whole thing. I, he couldn't even believe it that he was able to pull it off. I mean, it's amazing when you can challenge when you challenge your children. I learned that from Spy Kids. I challenge those kids so much on a daily basis that I thought I got to do this to my own kids because you tend not to challenge your own kids very much. Not like that. You don't go and make them hang on a wire one day and then go do this the other day and, and do that the next day. You know, and uh, and it really it really helped. It made super kids out of them. So we kind of took that and put that into this movie as well how to raise your kids in a way that they're constantly challenged so that they can, they can go save the world. They, they will save the world this next generation. Do each of you have a project that ultimately didn't move forward for whatever reason, uh, even though it was close to production? And uh, what happened, if you can share? Uh, the one that I always think about that got away was called Go Like Hell, uh, which eventually did get made is Ford versus Ferrari. Uh, I, uh, I always wanted to make a racing film and, um, the thing about racing movies is it can't be about racing. It has to have some amazing story underneath, uh, to, to warn itself being made. And, um, that story was one of those great, uh, stories of, a, of an incredible friendship and an incredible rivalry and an incredible, you know, d incredibly dangerous race, um, so uh, we, um, I wouldn't say we got close to production, but I got to the point where I had uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt at a table read, reading the script together, which was pretty what? amazing. Um, wow. But uh, we couldn't get the budget to the, to the number it had to be at. Um, and it was the right number. Um, but uh, so that was the one for me that, got away, but I was thrilled to see that uh, they ended up making an, an amazing version of it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that, that would be my story. How close was the vision of the version that you had to what uh, Mangle brought to screen with Ford v Ferrari? The script was the same. Um, and I think his approach was generally how I was going to do it, which was real cars, real racing, obviously making it with Tom, uh, that's, you know, that's the only way that it would be made is if we were strapping, you know, in some ways it was the Top Gun, what we did for Top Gun, we were going to do for car racing with mounted cameras and all that. Um, so, uh, uh, I thought he did an excellent version and I thought Christian Bale and Matt Damon, you know, nailed the character. So that was a case where like you go in going, God, I hope this is good because I love the story so much. And um, I actually saw it with Tom. We were both thrilled. 
uh, <laughs> uh, when we saw it. So that was, that was, that's, that's kind of a weird, it's a weird thing to see someone make a movie of something that you had kind of got close to making, but, um, but uh, they did an amazing job with it. I, I'm actually surprised at how long it took me to think of it. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, I was going to direct a Star Wars movie. Uh, but it took me like literally like a minute because I, I couldn't, I, I'm being serious. Uh, were, you really, were you really close to the, you weren't close to shooting or anything? You weren't no, to- I mean, we were, we were, uh, you know, art and, and, and writing. It was a development thing. It was a script development thing. And, and, you know, it, I guess the, the lesson from it, uh, is, you know, I'd, I'd always, um, I've, I've been very fortunate, you know, and then um, I, the films that I've directed, I've, I've always really, uh, the path that I, that I wanted to follow and the path that the, you know, the every, everyone involved wanted to follow was the same. Uh, and it's, it's totally possible for, uh, you know, people to see two totally different paths, uh, through the woods. So, you know, that, that was just an experience, uh, that obviously you can imagine, you know, as, as all of these things, like it can get to the point of being, you know, traumatic when there's something that you care about that much and you've invested that much in it. Uh, but that's one of the things, uh, that you accept when you, when you, take on uh any any role uh in film uh, and especially when you become a storyteller that they are going to be heartbreaks you know there's going to be crushing disappointments and then there's going to be uh there's going to be victories and uh hopefully they'll balance out uh in the end uh, i didn't get to have a, a table read with tom cruise and brad pitt that's pretty awesome um i do i actually hold on a second i got something cool hold on look at this. <laughs> toy box bring the toy over yeah, there we go. That's cool. my version of Tom Cruise. And uh, so this is uh, one of the, my son and I designed a ship because uh, we were designing ships. And one of the two, I have two ships. One of them is, is at the theme park uh, at Disneyland. This is the other one. And it only exists in this 3D model. And for Christmas, it's called the Thai Marauder. Uh, and it's, it does this. Cool. Uh, and for Christmas, uh, the guys painted it for me. So I only had this in a 3D model. And now this is the only one in the world. Uh, wow. And it's an amazing memory uh, for me of something that, you know, when I got to do something that was an incredible experience uh, and just from start to finish that I was able to to make a Star Wars ship with my son. How old is your son when he made that? Uh, he's 11 now. Yeah. Uh, and this is this is him, I guess, at, at nine. But Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, man, keep working you know, with I can't you tell know you, that experience. I can't tell you how fun it is to work with your kids on, on movies. It, it When I turned 50, I was thinking, well, I guess I could just – direct more movies. I guess I could just keep going. And then I realized it's all about mentorship and now the next generation and working with them. And, and now I'm more excited like for the next 10, 15 years to work alongside them. Cause they're, they got the brain that I had, you know, 25 years ago. And, um, it's, it's amazing. You, you create together, you come up to stuff. You've got the same references cause they grew up with the stuff you love and you love their stuff. And then you, it doesn't even feel like work though on set with you every day and you're coming, you're jamming, they're figuring out, they're learning how to create a big project where they can apply anywhere in life. I realize the movie making applies is, is, ba- is basically life microcosm, how to get anything done, how to come up with a plan, how to make it, how to accomplish, how to realize a dream. So it's not about going and being a filmmaker. You're going to learn how to live life. You're going to learn what it's like to come up with something that you're just completely daunting to get on the other side of it. And then your idea of what impossible is just grows and it puts food on the table, gives us something to work on and it's family time. I mean, you're checking all the boxes. You're living the life when you can do that. So keep, you're going in the right direction. I can tell you that I'm <laughs> a blast just us all creating together and you see that they're just going to be superhuman because of they're getting these experiences that we don't get till we're older. We've had to build up a long time. They're getting that right off the bat. And they're like, yeah, got it. Okay, good. That's how it works. Okay, cool. Next. And they just, and they blow me away how much, how much they've learned and how far they can go. Yeah. And I mean, where are you going to get the perspective too of a, of a child? Uh, you do, you know, at a certain point you can try to hold on to that as long as you can. Yeah. Uh, but especially even when it comes to what we were talking about earlier, you know, about, making new versions of the stories that we love. Uh, you know, there are two audiences. There are your peers, there's us, because we grew up on these movies, but we also, you ha- we have to recognize that, that this is their time now, that they get these movies now, and, uh, and that you have to make it possible that they feel the same sense of ownership over these stories that we're telling that we felt. Uh, and the reason why we all get so riled up about it uh, is because we care so deeply. And yeah. 
down the line, uh, they're going to probably feel the same way, hopefully, uh, about, you know, what we're all doing now, I hope. I think fans understand that the trailer is designed for the casual moviegoer who goes to the movies once or twice a year, and you're trying to sell to them as to why this movie should be the one you pick. But then there's tons of people that watch trailers and or go to the movies all the time and see a trailer, and these trailers sometimes give away these huge beats of a movie and things that you want to keep under wraps. Can you sort of talk about working with the marketing department, crafting trailers, and fighting for secrecy versus knowing you have to show some of it to get people in those seats? I've got one that comes to mind, and uh, it was my own fault, I think, for uh, casting the person. So the, uh, the movie was Oblivion, and one of the big twists in the film was that uh, Tom Cruise um, was not the uh, alone on planet Earth. Um, and that was a big reveal in the movie and certainly not something you would never put in a trailer uh, unless you cast Morgan Freeman as one of those humans. And ultimately, uh, we showed him in the trailer giving that away. So that was something that I didn't want to do. But at the same time, when you're selling a movie, um, you know, you need people to go in the first place. You were asking about, you know, battles fought and lost. I would say the, the battles most often lost come in, in on the marketing side of things. Um, that's the one place where, uh, you know, there, there are real needs that exist uh, in order to, to get this thing, uh, the audience that will justify its cost, frankly. And, um, uh, you know, it's from any filmmaker, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest frustration is that, you know, if you have something that's, that's one of those moments, that's just a crazy moment where you can't believe what the hell you're watching, uh, and people are gonna have that experience uh, outside uh, of the context of your movie. They'll have had it you know, on the internet, they'll have, they'll have watched it on their phone, and, and they will have already gone through that. So by the time they actually see it, uh, instead of like, oh my God, this is, this is insane, this is cool, what they're thinking is, well, there's that part. I went into the business knowing that that was a danger because I saw Terminator 2 and I remember I said, I bet Jim didn't know that we we're going to reveal that Terminator was good in the trailer. Like right off the bat, that's the first thing they're going to say because for 30 minutes, he makes it look like he's a bad guy and you think he's a bad guy, but you see it coming for 30 minutes because you didn't, you didn't predict that was a trailer. So I always thought about the trailer while I was shooting any, I would actually shoot special things for the trailer. I would actually cut my own trailer. Wow, because the marketing, it's, filmmaking is very linear, tremendously linear. No one's thinking about the trailer until the movie's done and they give it to the marketing department and then they start thinking about it. So you gotta be way ahead of that. Otherwise you're gonna get something and it's never, you put so much care into every aspect of the filmmaking process and then you're just delivered two cuts of a trailer and you got to start picking between them. Here's the trick <laughs> that's served me very well. Yep. I always I shoot my own poster and I always cut my own trailer from the very beginning during post. In fact, what I took to Comic-Con was my own, what became the trailer of Sin City. Um, it was all the aim. You know what the A material is. You're, I'm cutting it while I'm editing the movie. And when you show it to a studio and you show them a poster and you show them a trailer, they can't unsee it. They can't unsee it. And everything they see from then on is wrong because the first thing they saw that got their attention is now stuck in their head. And if they come up with something that surprises you, great. Yeah. You know, better, but at least you're, you've got something in your back pocket. You've got a poster that, that even Fox on Predators just could not beat our poster. And they came back and said, congratulations, your poster is going to be the poster. <laughs> Tell your team, it's like me and one other guy. You might as well start working with it and thinking about how you're going to sell it because you realize, oh, my big twist is going to end up in the trailer if I don't put something else in there ahead of that that feels like it could be a third act for a trailer. And it's a good exercise. It actually helps the storytelling. It actually makes the movie always better to have those extra things in there mm -hmm. because it just makes the third act even feel better. You don't have to give it away. What's been the biggest pinch me moment of your career? Almost every day on a film set is a pinch me moment, but one that sticks out just because he directed my favorite film of all time was uh, Steven Spielberg showed up at one of my VFX reviews on Tron just because he wanted to see 
Wow, cool. what we were up to. So uh, he just showed up one day, sat next to me, and for an hour while I went through effect shots and just watched six or seven year old version of me here that the director of Raiders of the Lost Ark would one day sit next to me and watch me make my film would and still is to this day pretty pretty mind blowing. So that's one that'll always stick with me. I used to mix at Skywalker Ranch because I just always admired George Lucas was the biggest independent filmmaker of all time. So successful that people forget he's an independent filmmaker, but um, you know, just rabidly so. Um, I was mixing at Skywalker and he saw that I, I actually mixed my own movies too. So he said, Hey, come over here. So he went and showed me the digital cameras for the first time that he was about to use in Star Wars. And I went, this looks, I'm going to, I'm going to buy two of these. I'm going to shoot my next movie. So, and then a few years later, he called me and said, Hey, you've, you've shot now three digital films. Could you come up for a gathering I'm having at Skywalker Ranch where I want to do a presentation to all the top directors in Hollywood. And I want you to give a presentation to yours. I'm going to show Attack of the Clones and you're going to show some clips from your stuff. We have a lunch together. And I was sitting with George Lucas and Francis Coppola, and who's also starting to dabble in digital. And George says, it's not surprising to me that the three people who live outside of Hollywood are shooting digital. <laughs> and so I got my two, my kids, my three little kids, and I took them around. And I said, okay, you see that guy? He made Jaws and Raiders. You see this guy? He made The Force and Yoda. And this guy, he made The Terminator. And Spielberg said, Robert, come here. He took me over to his kid who was watching TV, but playing a video game on TV. He said, hey, son. And his son was like playing the game. What? He goes, this guy directed Spy Kids. He went, this kid looked like, like turned away from the TV and looked like, you could tell he'd seen it like 50 times. <laughs> just like, wow, Steven Spielberg's son watches my movies. So I thought that was my pitch me moment. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Mine was, I, uh, we were recording the score for, for the first Jurassic World and Giacchino, uh, Michael Giacchino has a, a relationship with Paul McCartney and he came up to me and he was like, look, I just, if it's cool with you, Paul wants to come by tomorrow uh, with his family, with his kids uh, and just listen to the orchestra for a while. He loves orchestra stuff. It was like amazing. So I call my dad and my dad was a musician. He had a country rock band in the eighties and I used to go see him play like he'd open for like Willie Nelson and like stadium. So he was like, he was my, my music hero when I was a kid. And I called him up and I was like, dad, I'm going to bring you down here. I'm flying you down here. I'm not going to tell you why. Just, just be here tomorrow. So he came down and he shows up and I told him like, you know, 10 minutes, Paul McCartney's going to be in here. So stay cool. And so Paul walks in and he brings his whole family and they listen to it. And we have this moment when we're all touring uh, just these different instruments were going around and Paul's, you know, seeing all these made Michael has a lot of different kinds of instruments besides, you know, what you traditionally use. And I went and introduced him to my dad. Um, and I was like, oh, this is, this is my father, you know, Robert and uh, Paul McCartney looks my dad in the eye and goes, Ooh, you must be real proud of you, boy, then. And I was like, we're done. <laughs> we're, we're, we're done here, dad. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Oh, that's great. Let me end this by saying a sincere thank you to you guys for uh, jumping on um, this Zoom chat and for uh, doing the panel Directors on Directing for Comic-Con at home. Um, I, I say a sincere thank you. And I know that for everyone who's watching right now, um, they all say thank you for sharing such great stories and, um, and you know educating a lot of people on what really goes on behind the scenes on making movies. Hope everyone stays safe and healthy, and I look forward to seeing your future endeavors.